January 6, 2014, at 9 a.m. to ensure full public participation. Notice of the January 6 hearing should be published in the Texas Register today. I will consider public comments presented today or at the January 6 hearing, so you don't need to attend both hearings to repeat your comments. In addition, I will consider written comments submitted through 5 o'clock p.m. on January 6, 2014. We have also each hearing day. The webcast will be available for later reference on our webcast. In addition, we have an overflow room next door. It's 102 if anybody feels like they'd like to step out and move over there. Anyone wishing to speak this morning should fill out a witness card and submit it to the Deputy Chief Clerk. I'll call on you and then ask you to identify yourself for the record. The witness cards are in the back of the room and they look like this. I'll begin by calling on Jamie Walker, Associate Commissioner of Licensing Services, Section of the Financial Regulation Division here at TDI. Thanks, Jamie. Good morning, Commissioner. My name is Jamie Walker, and I'm the Associate Commissioner for Licensing Services here at TDI. With me is Justin Beam, Staff Attorney with Policy Development Council. I'm here on behalf of the Department of Insurance to propose rules relating to the regulation of those who provide navigator services under Insurance Code Chapter 4154, Title 42 of the United States Code, Section 18031, or any regulation enacted under Section 18031 through new Subchapter W in Administrative Code, Chapter 19. These rules were published on the TDI website and distributed via TDI's e-news on December 3rd and published in the Texas Register on December 6th. These rules are proposed in order to provide a state solution to help and protect Texas consumers by ensuring the security of their private information and ensuring that they are able to find and apply for health coverage under the federally run health benefit exchange with the assistance of qualified navigators. The proposed rules are based on SB 1795, which added Chapter 4154 to the insurance code. Chapter 4154 requires the Commissioner of Insurance to determine whether standards and qualifications for navigators provided under Title 42 of the United States Code, Section 18031, and any regulation enacted under Section 18031 are sufficient to ensure that navigators can perform their required duties. Chapter 4154 also requires the Commissioner to make a good faith effort to work in cooperation with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to propose improvements to the federal standards, and if ever, after a reasonable interval, the Commissioner determines that the standards remain insufficient, the Commissioner shall establish rules to address the insufficiencies. Chapter 4154 also sets minimum standards that must be included in the rules adopted by the Commissioner, includes restrictions on navigator advertising and restrictions on how a navigator can be compensated, and requires the Commissioner to adopt rules for additional training for navigators as necessary to ensure compliance with the changes in state or federal law. Prior to posting the proposed rules, we conducted research into the federal regulations applicable to navigators. We reviewed the federal regulations and the concerns various parties have raised concerning the federal regulations. We conducted a stakeholder meeting on September 30, 2013 to gather information from the public regarding the registration of navigators, training of navigators, safeguards to protect consumer privacy, and the continuing education requirements for navigators. Following the stakeholder meeting, we met or conducted teleconferences with navigator entities, consumer advocates, and representatives of healthcare provider groups. During the same period of time as the meetings with stakeholders were being held, we also requested and conducted multiple conference calls with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services regarding the federal standards. Some of the topics discussed during the calls with HHS include the applicability of the federal standards only to entities that receive grant funds, the differences in regulations between navigators and certified application counselors, the types of assisters that will be helping Texas consumers, the training requirements for federal certification, the location of many of the privacy and security requirements in the contract with grant recipients as opposed to in the regulations, the grant process, and requirements established by other states regarding navigators. TDI staff also confirmed with HHS that the minimum requirements established in Chapter 4154 were not met by the federal regulations. After our review of the federal regulations setting standards for navigators, meetings with stakeholders, and discuss discussions with HHS, we posted an outline of solutions for potential insufficiencies identified by department staff. The outline presented steps that could be taken in either federal regulations or state rules to address issues with the standards set by the federal regulations. We invited the public to comment on the outline 
and have taken into consideration the comments we received in preparation of this rule proposal. In addition to inviting public comment on the outline, department staff conducted a teleconference with HHS staff on December 2, 2013, to discuss the content of the outline. HHS staff said HHS was not currently considering revising, revising any regulations to address the issues raised in the outline and confirmed that solutions set out in the outline did not present federal preemption concerns. HHS staff suggested that the department proceed with its proposal of rules. Following the publication of the proposed rules, department staff met with HHS staff on Monday, December 16th in person while in Washington, D.C. to discuss the text of the rule proposal. We discussed various aspects of the rule during the meeting and HHS staff said there's no current plans to revise federal regulations to address the issues identified by the department and did not identify anything in the proposed rule that would automatically be preempted by federal law. Under these rules, the department will regulate individuals and entities that provide navigator services in Texas. Exceptions exist for licensed life, accident and health insurance agents, licensed life and health insurance counselors, and licensed life and health insurance companies. The rules are also not applicable to certified application counselors or individuals or entities that provide assistance to consumers under and in compliance with state or federal authority other than Title 42 United States Code Section 18031 to the extent that the individuals or entities are providing assistance consistent with that state or federal authority. Under the rules, entities and individuals providing enrollment assistance in a federal health exchange will be required to register with TDI. Requirements for navigator registrations will include proof of U.S. citizenship or immigration status to obtain employment in the U.S., documentation of compliance with education requirements, fingerprints and a background check, and evidence of financial responsibility to protect individuals against wrongful acts. Navigators and entities and individuals providing navigator services will be prohibited from the following. Charging consumers for providing information about health coverage, selling, soliciting, or negotiating health insurance coverage, recommending a specific health plan, providing advice regarding substantive benefits and comparative benefits of different health plans, and engaging in electioneering activities or finance or otherwise supporting the candidacy of individuals for government positions. In addition, under the rules, insurance code provisions related to privacy and the protection of personal information would also apply to navigators. TDI staff will continue to work with HHS staff to determine whether any of the insufficiencies noted in the rule proposal have been addressed in federal regulations. If federal regulations are modified to resolve any of the insufficiencies, the rules will be modified as appropriate prior to adoption. That is my overview of the proposal. Contingent on any comments we might receive and changes suggested based upon comments and any modifications made to federal regulation, staff respectfully request that you consider for approval and adoption new Subchapter W consisting of Sections 19-4001 to 19-4018. Staff has received some written comments on the proposed rules. Currently, we're reviewing the rule text to evaluate changes based upon the comments received. Staff will also evaluate the rule text based on the comments made at today's hearing. The same process will be used for any future written comments received during the comment period and any statements made at the January 6th hearing. This concludes my presentation, and I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Good morning. I've scheduled a second hearing to receive additional public input here January 6th, 2014.
the application themselves. Perhaps most telling is the November 6 testimony of Secretary Kathleen Sebelius before the U.S. Senate Finance Committee. In an exchange with Senator John Cornyn, Secretary Sebelius confirmed that it is possible for a convicted felon to be hired as a navigator, and she acknowledged the authority of states to add in additional background checks and other features to protect against that possibility. Despite these well-documented shortcomings, it appears as though HHS has not fully cooperated with the Texas Department of Insurance. This is perhaps best exemplified by the refusal of HHS to share with the Texas Department of Insurance a navigator contract, a contract template, or simply the portion of a contract addressing navigator privacy standards. Texas Department of Insurance has followed Senate Bill 1795's prerequisites to, to the promulgation of rules. Now, because navigators are conducting business in Texas under federal rules and regulations that are insufficient, a state navigator rule pursuant to Senate Bill 1795 is of the utmost importance and should be enacted as soon as possibly, as soon as possible. The rule drafted by the agency and up for public consideration will ensure that navigators are qualified and screened via fingerprinting and a background check, properly educated on the Texas Medicaid program and ethics, required to comply with the privacy requirements and the insurance code and TDI rules, required to take federal and state training, required to register with the state on an annual basis, required to secure and maintain evidence of financial responsibility to protect individuals against wrongful acts, misrepresentations, errors, omissions, or negligence, and prohibited from electioneering activities or financing or otherwise supporting candidacy of an individual for a government position. To the last point about prohibiting navigators from electioneering, it is of particular importance that elections are free, fair, and honest. To meet that end, it is imperative that navigators, most of whom are funded by taxpayer dollars, do not engage in electioneering as they sign up Texans for benefit programs or subsidized health insurance. In this context, it is worth noting that voter registration is a built-in component of the federal exchange. Additionally, the electioneering prohibition is particularly urgent because Texas navigator entities have exhibited political intent. Videos by Project Virtus show a representative of a Texas navigator entity in Roll America seemingly merging the business of being an Affordable Care Act navigator with five to add the no electioneering provision to the bill and I continue to believe that prohibition is of critical importance. Generally, regulations should be minimal and should only be instituted when there is imminent and compelling public need for the regulations. The rule drafted by TDI meets those criteria. Navigators may be private entities and individuals, but in the course of acting as a navigator, they are serving a public purpose. Most navigators are funded through federal grants. The core nature of their core functions, coupled with the well-documented insufficiency of federal standards, demand that the state institute our own standards. Navigators will continue to operate in Texas whether or not this rule is implemented, just as they have operated since the October 1st launch of healthcare.gov. Therefore, the implementation of these rules is immediately imperative. There have been enough well-documented issues that a delay in implementing this rule would be akin to the state looking the other way in the face of abusive practices that are offensive and disappointing. We must not look the other way. Please proceed with implementing this rule, which is of the utmost importance to safeguard against fraud, identity theft, electioneering by navigators, and other harms that may arise out of the vague and incomplete federal standards. I thank you for your thoughtful and thorough work in exposing the staggering inefficiencies in the Federal Navigator Regulations. Thank you for your adherence to Senate Bill 1795, including the promulgation of the rule that is being considered today. 
Following the implementation of this rule, I look forward to working with the Texas Department of Insurance and other parties to strengthen the state's regulation of navigators where possible. I hope that the Texas Department of Insurance will continue to examine ideas such as the institution of unannounced regulatory inspections of registered navigators, requiring navigators to inform individuals of an improper disclosure of personal information, and quarterly reporting to navigators by the Texas Department of Insurance. The agency should also pursue rulemaking to apply to certified application counselors, another class of application assisters who fulfill duties similar to navigators. In closing, please adopt the draft rule that is up for consideration. Then we can work together to strengthen navigator rules and pursue rules for those who perform similar functions. Thank you so much for the opportunity today to visit with you and give our opinion. Thank you so much, Representative Morrison. Thank you. I appreciate it. Senator Watson. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioner Rathgaver, Council. Uh, I really do appreciate the opportunity to comment on the proposed rules to implement Senate Bill 1795, a bill that I authored in the last regular legislative session allowing for the regulation of health care navigators. Let's begin with the vast majority of navigators are hardworking, honorable folks committed to helping their fellow Texans find health insurance. In places like Austin and Fort Worth, some of them work through the United Way. My bill, Senate Bill 1795, had a very clear and expressly stated purpose. Quote, to ensure that Texans are able to find and apply for affordable health coverage under any federally run health benefit exchange, while helping consumers in this state. Now all of us can agree that helping consumers must be a priority as we approach these rules. There are things in this proposal that I think we all want as part of any set of state regulations to help protect those looking to find and apply for affordable health coverage under a federally run health exchange. I strongly support privacy protections and specific laws relate, Texas laws related to privacy. Further, my bill specifically forbids convicted felons from being navigators. So it's clear and clearly appropriate that background checks be conducted on potential navigators. The bill specifically and expressly prohibits electioneering. It's in the bill. Those measures strike a balance between protecting consumers and increasing access to health insurance. The justification for them is self-evident. They are political straw men. In other cases, though, the department owes the people of Texas an explanation. In instances where rules place a burden on navigators or represent an obvious obstacle or reduction in people being able to help Texans find and apply for affordable health coverage under a federally run health benefit exchange or preventing people from getting health insurance, the department needs to demonstrate that it's following the intent of the law and acting in the best interests of hard-working Texans who need health insurance for themselves, their children, and their loved ones. Absent such an explanation, there's no assurance. There's a presumption that the express intent of the law isn't being met. We love Texas. Every one of us in here loves Texas. We also know Texas can do better ensuring that our people have health insurance. At least, I hope we all know that. 
I hope we're all aware of Texas's shameful status as the state with the highest percentage of uninsured in the country. Even after the years of inaction in the face of literally life-threatening problems facing Texas's massive population of uninsured, I hope those in control of this state know that Texas can do better when it comes to keeping Texans healthy. That's what Senate Bill 1795 is meant to do. It makes Texas better when it comes to the issue of our uninsured if it's implemented correctly and not distorted. The rules it allows should help, should help make the lives of the uninsured better. Perhaps most importantly, Commissioner, any time the proposed rules create an obstacle or make it harder to ensure that Texans are able to find and apply for affordable health coverage under a federally run health benefit exchange. You need to demonstrate that the obstacle you've created is truly and meaningfully about consumer protection. These rules must not be seen as products of raw political pressure to impose needless, expensive, burdensome, bureaucratic regulations that would deny reliable health care to Texans who need it. It is enormously regrettable that this issue has been so badly politicized, but it's not unique in that way. In Texas, health insurance in general has become an awful and inappropriate theater for political battles and grandstanding. Tens of billions of dollars have been rejected, despite the impact that that money would have for Texans who lack health insurance. The very leaders who attacked the Federal Health Insurance Exchange refuse to create a state exchange that might constructively address their criticism. And now, even the hardworking people who are trying to help their fellow Texans navigate the health exchange they've come under fire. Is it because there's a real problem that needs to be addressed or because so-called leaders feel the need to fight a cynical, heartless political battle designed to make it harder for Texans to find health insurance? You can't forget the context in which these rules are being drafted. And you must not forget who ultimately will suffer from any unfairness that's incorporated into these rules. It's not the navigators or any other new version of this old political football. It's the many, many Texans who just want to sleep at night without fear that illness or injury might bankrupt their families. There's a reason people are skeptical about your process. The best way the only way to put that skepticism to rest will be for you to plainly and transparently justify provisions that the department ultimately adopts. So we're asking you to justify the additional training requirements in these rules. I'll bet that everyone here supports training. Again, a political straw man. But we need to understand why you think existing training requirements need to be as much as tripled. Current federal rules require 20 to 30 hours of training. Your rules would add another 40. Increasing the requirements by this much, as much as 200%, will decrease the amount of help that's available to Texans who need health insurance. By your department's own estimates, this training could cost anywhere between $200 and $800 per navigator. That would be a significant and in some cases decisive burden on individuals and organizations that are legally forbidden from recouping those costs from the people they're trying to help. Where precisely did the target of 40 additional hours come from? What do navigators need to know that the federal requirements aren't allowing them to learn? If you're going to impose these burdens and create those barriers, I respectfully submit you owe Texans a clear, specific reason. How do you justify the cost 
of complying with these requirements. As pointed out, navigators can't by law collect a fee for the services they provide. And other similar assistance programs have managed to train and update their community partners at no charge to the participating groups. So why are these navigators being assessed fees when they can't collect them themselves? It's a remarkable barrier. How does the Texas Department of Insurance justify deviations from the fiscal note to Senate Bill 1795? The fiscal note, which was produced just seven months ago with TDI's input, clearly states the assumption that any costs associated with the implementation of this bill would be absorbed within existing staff and resources. Nothing's changed except for a rule that now charges a fee to people that can't charge a fee themselves. How does TDI justify these cumbersome financial reporting requirements? Again, I think every person here believes navigators need to be accountable. I passed this bill to ensure that the state could protect Texans from bad or negligent actors. But as you're going to hear today, some of these reporting requirements make little sense in the context of the nonprofit agencies that will be providing these services. Some of these requirements seem scaled for insurance companies, not community-based organizations, thereby creating an additional barrier to people being able to get help as they seek access for health insurance. The department needs to justify why it included language in the proposed regulations that was intentionally kept out of the bill authorizing these regulations. During the session, we intentionally rejected proposals to prohibit navigators from providing, quote, advice regarding substantive benefits or comparative benefits of different health benefit plans. And yet, the language was added to the draft rules. Why? It should be obvious that Texans, whether they're technically navigators or not, can help their friends and neighbors understand and compare features of different health plans without recommending that this consumer buy a specific plan. People should have the ability to walk into, for instance, their state senator's office and get help from a staff member comparing and understanding their options. And navigators need to be able to help consumers compare and understand insurance options without recommending which plan to purchase. I simply can't imagine an explanation that would justify keeping this language in these regulations when it was rejected during the legislative session and it should be removed. And the department needs to justify its timetable. In three days, Many Texans will face another critical federal deadline for signing up for health insurance. Furthermore, if the department maintains its stated intent of requiring compliance with these still tentative rules by March 1st, you'll leave navigators with about one month, that's it, to comply. The timeline could well force these folks, the vast majority of whom are working in good faith to help their fellow Texans, to shut down their services just as open enrollment is closing and their help is most needed. It's only fair that you push back the implementation of the rule until after the enrollment period closes. Commissioner, today and throughout this public input process, you're going to hear these and other concerns. They all deserve thoughtful answers. More than that, they deserve your serious consideration. You owe it to Texans to follow the intent of this legislation and strike an appropriate balance between protecting consumers and keeping Texans healthy. I urge you, I believe you have a responsibility and I think an opportunity to take the politics out of this issue by reworking these rules and keeping uninsured Texans from suffering under them. Again, I appreciate both the time today, and I appreciate that you've scheduled a second hearing on this at my request on January 6th. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Senator. I appreciate it. Next, we're going to have Representative Sheets. Somehow or another, walking from my seat to here, I've hurt my foot. So. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I do, Senator. Thank we you. We know some people. Who do. <laughs> uh, good morning, Commissioner. Uh, again, my name's uh, Kenneth Sheets. I am the uh, state representative for House District 107, which includes portions of East Dallas, Garland, and Mesquite, uh, up in Dallas County. Uh, I also am a member of the t uh, House Insurance Committee, and I was uh, actively involved in the process of uh, passing this bill through the House. Uh, before I begin my comments, um, uh, I'd just like to uh, first note, uh, I've been asked to, uh, to point out that the House Republican Caucus Executive Committee did issue a letter to the Commissioner uh, with some written comments. Uh, I would also like to say I echo uh, Representative Morrison's uh, comments, and for brevity purposes, I'll try not to repeat a lot of what she said. Uh, and then uh, before I get into my comments, I would also like to address a little bit of what the Senator uh, brought up. Um, the first one being the legislative intent aspect of this bill. Uh, I do respect the Senator and I respect that uh, this is a bill that he authored originally, but this is a bill that became part of the legislative process and it's a bill that the entire legislature was involved in the passing of. Uh, and I'll tell you on the House side, we looked at this bill as a way to protect Texas consumers. And I believe the legislative con uh, intent of this bill is clear and unambiguous, and it provides you the authority to do what you're doing through these proposed rules. When we're talking about honest navigators and hardworking navigators, I have no doubt that the majority of those who are seeking to be navigators or who are currently working as navigators are honest, hardworking individuals. But the reality is, and the news reports show, that not all of them are. We've already seen it here in the state of Texas, and we're seeing it throughout the country. Up in my neck of woods, up in Dallas County, we have documented examples of navigators and those purporting to be navigators acting uh, outside the bounds and, uh, in some cases, um, encouraging people to commit tax of it. Excuse me, tax fraud. I would say that these requirements are not nonsensical and that the evidence that's already been presented in the public arena demonstrates that these requirements are necessary. I'd also talk about when we're, when we're talking about the legislative intent of this bill, if you follow the history of this bill, we made sure that we made this bill broader by the time we got it to its final form in order to recognize that the federal government had not yet published their rules on navigators, and we needed to make sure that you had the authority to act and make sure Texas consumers were uh, well protected. Now getting to my comments specifically, um, it's no secret, uh, I am publicly opposed to the Affordable Care Act. A lot of people refer to it as Obamacare. Uh, I believe that it's a bad policy for the state of Texas. I believe it's a bad policy for our entire country. But I'm not here to talk about the that law in its broad sense. Uh, obviously, I'm here to talk about the navigators. But when you look at the law in its broad sense, we've already had some incompetencies when we're talking about the rollout of this. Whether you're talking about the promises uh, from the uh, – from the proponents of this bill that if you like your insurance you'd be able to keep it or if you're talking about a website uh, that has had countless number of errors, mistakes, failures, whatever you want to call them and have made it impossible in some cases for people to enroll into these exchanges uh, these are just the tip of the spear when you talk about navigators we're seeing further problems we see specifically, as I addressed a few minutes ago, what happened up in Dallas County with Project Veritas and their investigation. We also have the U.S. House Committee on Oversight and Reforms report titled Risk of Fraud and Misinformation with Obamacare Outreach Campaign, How Navigators and Assistant Program Mismanagement Endangers Consumers. The, the, um, this committee noted that 
There could be felons who are acting as navigators. And yes, Senate Bill 1795 prohibits felons from acting as navigators within the state of Texas. But it also documents that we have poorly trained navigators out there. And we have those poorly trained navigators here in the st state of Texas as well. They're giving incorrect and inaccurate information to consumers. They're committing tax fraud. That is why additional training is required, so that they understand the material that they are trying to uh, help the general public understand. Insurance is not an easy subject. Insurance is a very complicated subject, as you know, ma'am. Uh, we don't need just 20 hours of training to help people understand health insurance. It's a very complex issue. Also, when we're talking about people's personally identifiable information, their financial information, their health information, people need to be trained on how to protect that information and know how important it is to keep that information confidential and private and make sure that whether it's through fraud, incompetence, or just uh, lack of training, that this information does not make it out there into the public realm. And yes, it may create an additional obstacle for these navigators who, in most cases, are being funded by federal grants, which are taxpayer dollars. It's important to make sure that our public, excuse me, our private information is not making it into the private realms, into the public realm. Also, there's no way the report uh, from the U.S. House demonstrated that there's no way for consumers to determine whether or not a navigator is certified. We're hoping that your your uh, your proposed regulations will take care of that. I also mentioned briefly James O'Keefe's investigation with Project Veritas. Again, it just reinforces the findings of uh, Congressman Issa's committee's hearings. And it verifies that it is happening here in the state of Texas. It also confirms that there are political operatives within the state who are trying to exploit the system for political gain. We need to make sure that we're cutting that off at the, at the root. Make sure that this doesn't happen. These, are be, these navigators are being paid for with federal grant dollars, again, taxpayer dollars. They shouldn't be out there electioneering and campaigning. We in the Texas legislature, especially those of us who have been working on health care and health insurance issues, identified early on that the standards and qualifications for navigators set forth by federal government could be insufficient. We didn't know at the time, because as I stated again earlier, we didn't know what the regulations were going to be. And that's why I supported Senate Bill 1795. That's why I worked on the House floor to make sure that my fellow representatives supported Senate Bill 1795. That's why it passed. This is an issue that I followed throughout the entire session. I followed it closely, and as I said, I, I helped navigate it through committee. We worked in a bipartisan manner. We amended it from its original form to the way you see it today. It clearly gives you the ability to set standards and qualifications for Texas navigators above and beyond those which are uh, in the federal regulations. And it's there to protect Texas consumers from potential fraud and to ensure their personal information is protected. It is not unambiguous. The intent is clear. You have this authority. I applaud you and your staff. I'm working. Uh, excuse me. I applaud you and your staff on the work and effort you've put into drafting these common sense rules. These rules will be helpful to protect Texans and our health insurance markets from the abuses and incompetencies identified in both Chairman Issa's committee's report and the James O'Keefe videos. If Texans are going to be forced into these new health insurance mandates, we should do everything in our power to protect them from fraud and incompetence. I urge you to pass this, uh, these, these regulations and these standards, and I appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. I hope your food's okay. Representative Turner. Next is State Representative Chris Turner. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioner Rathgaber and Council. Uh, for the record, I'm State Representative Chris Turner representing House District 101 in Tarrant County, which includes parts of Arlington and Grand Prairie. 
I am here today to speak in opposition to the proposed rules as currently written. I want to thank the Department for this opportunity to speak with you about this very important issue. And in addition to my comments here, I will be submitting uh, written comments of, uh, regarding the proposed rules for your consideration. <clears throat> you know, like Senator Watson, I'm happy to support, and I think most of us are, you know, reasonable uh, rules uh, that help to, to further implement uh, Senate Bill 1795. Uh, background checks that assure that the letter of the law is met, that convicted felons can't be navigators, uh, and measures, reasonable measures to protect consumers' personal information uh, are perfectly fine, and I have no problem with those provisions. In September, I shared with you some of my concerns about Governor Perry's directives to the Department of Insurance. I believe, for the most part, the items contained in that letter were clearly intended to impede and interfere with Navigator's basic ability to help our fellow Texans apply for and obtain affordable, comprehensive health insurance. After that hearing and subsequent meetings, I have begun to hope that the proposed rules might reflect the legitimate concerns that have been laid out for the last two months by elected officials and those Navigator's nonprofit organizations and others who are working hard every day to connect uninsured Texans with access to affordable health care. Today, I'm here to tell you that I'm disappointed in much of what was produced. These rules, for the most part, do not appear that they are aimed to protecting consumers. Rather, they seem clearly intended to make a political statement, a statement that if it is made, will be done to the detriment of millions of uninsured Texans. As a member of the House Committee on Insurance, I followed Senate Bill 1795 from the committee process to the final vote on the House floor. Like Representative Sheets, I serve on the committee. And to my recollection, the intent of the legislation throughout this process uh, during the session and, and today uh, is quite clear, and it's, quote, to provide a state solution to ensure that Texans are able to find and apply for affordable health coverage under any federally run health benefit exchange while helping consumers in this state. It was not to create barriers for navigators by burying them in cumbersome regulations and expensive requirements, ultimately hindering their ability to do their jobs. And it was not to make it even harder than it already is for the one out of four Texans without health insurance to obtain coverage. <clears throat> now before I go into the specifics, uh, my specific concerns about the proposed rules, I want to just respond to something uh, that's been mentioned several times up here this morning already, uh, and that involves the Project Veritas videos and, and James O'Keefe. Um, he's been invoked multiple times, and, and as Senator Watson said, uh, I hope we could all agree that the vast majority of navigators in this state and in this country are well-intentioned, hardworking, uh, I would argue well-trained people who are doing their best to help people in their community. Now, is what was seen on those videos uh, inappropriate and wrong? Absolutely. We'd all agree with that. <clears throat> and, and that entity that employed those navigators took appropriate action, immediate action, and, and terminated uh, the responsible employees. <clears throat> that said, surely this state is not going to pass new rules and regulations based on heavily edited videos done by a man who pled guilty to trying to tamper with the phone lines of a United States Senator. Surely we're not going to do that. So, regarding my concerns about the proposed rules. First, the timeline. On December 10th, you received a letter from myself and 53 other members of the House of Representatives requesting that the comment period be extended. With an important marketplace deadline just three days from today and Christmas on next Wednesday, it would seem that this is not the most convenient date that could have been selected for this important hearing. However, I do appreciate and thank you for the addition of the January 6th hearing. Uh, but I do believe that not allowing comments beyond that date will limit the ability of navigators and other stakeholders to react to what has been discussed. Another issue with timing, once the rules are passed, navigators and organizations will have little time to complete these excessive requirements by the March 1st deadline. According to the Texas Administrative and Procedure Act, once a rule is approved by an agency, it must be sent to the Secretary of State and may not go into effect for 20 days. If the rules proposed are passed on the earliest possible date, 
which would be January 7th, which I hope is not the case because I hope the Department will take the time to read and respond to all of the comments it receives before passing rules, but if it did pass on the 7th, they would go into effect on January 27th. Navigators and entities will then need to send in their applications. Now, based on conversations between House staff and the Department, I have been told that it will take your agency an estimated two weeks to approve each application. With that, if navigators and navigator entities are to fully comply with the rules as currently written, they will need to complete applications, fulfill fingerprint requirements, meet the owner's financial responsibility requirements, and send in their applications and payments no later than around February 14th. That's a lot for these individuals and nonprofits to do in two weeks. And I have to believe that this process will severely limit their ability to fill the pr primary mission, which is to help people sign up for coverage in the last eight weeks of open enrollment. Secondly, the rules state that an individual may not perform, quote, navigator services, unquote, unless and until they are registered with TDI. What exactly are navigator services under these rules? It's not clear to me what that includes. If navigator services include education, outreach, answering questions about the marketplace, then these regulations will ensnare thousands of people across our state who are simply providing information to fellow Texans. For example, I, along with every member of my staff, would fall into that category based on the education and outreach work we have been doing and will continue to do in our district, encouraging people to sign up in the marketplace if they don't have health insurance. Thirdly, the cost. We have representatives from navigator entities in this room today. Many are community organizations and nonprofits, and I suspect you will hear from many of them that they cannot afford the costs that the rules uh, currently contemplate. In order to comply, navigators or entities will per person have to pay $50 to apply for registration, up to $800 per training, $60 for print fingerprinting, and $50 for registration renewal. And that's, that's up to nearly $1,000 per person. And that doesn't even include the cost of the surety bonds or other means of financial responsibility required in these rules. Now, speaking of those bonds, it is far from clear this state surety bond requirement is even permissible under federal law given federal regulations prohibiting errors and omissions insurance. It is equally unclear who navigators are supposed to go to in order to purchase a surety bond and what that product will look like. For some organizations, the financial impact could very well force them out of providing navigator services altogether, which I believe would have a very negative impact on our state. And finally, the training requirement. I agree that consumer protection is critical, and I don't object uh, in principle to additional training. But what I do object to is requiring an arbitrary number of hours, which as far as I can tell is solely based on the governor's recommendation. I have yet to see any justification from the department or anywhere else of the need for an additional 40 hours of training. With this requirement, navigators will be required, will be required in total to receive 60 to 70 hours of training. Similar programs administered by this and other state agencies require training based on content, not on a specific number of hours. For example, take the Community Partner Program, which trains volunteers to help Texans apply for Medicaid, CHIP, SNAP, and TANF benefits. In order to receive certification from HHSC, that agency requires four to five hours of training with annual retraining. The Health Insurance Advocacy and Counseling Program, also known as HICAP, is run by TDI in conjunction with Texas Legal Services and Texas Department of Aging and Disability. HICAP staff and volunteers provide enrollment assistance to those seeking Medicare-related public and private benefits. In order to be certified by TDI, a total of 25 hours of training is required. As far as I can tell, there is no training requirement needed to be a licensed health insurance agent, just an exam and 30 hours of every two years of continuing ed. Why are navigators being singled out and treated differently than others who essentially perform similar duties and handle the same kind of personal information. I would like to believe that there is a sound policy reason, but no matter how hard I look, I can't seem to find one, nor have I heard proponents of these rules articulate one. From what I can tell, it boils down to one thing, and that's politics. Now, everyone knows that politics is everywhere when it comes to the Affordable Care Act, and we all understand that. But navigators have simply become the latest easy target in an all-out assault on the ACA. The Texas Department of Insurance mission, though, 
and purpose is too important to allow this agency to become another political tool used by politicians who oppose this law. The bottom line is these rules won't help the 6.4 million Texas consumers who lack health insurance. I implore you to listen to everybody who comes to testify today and, and truly read and deliberate on their written comments between now and January 6th and after that date as, as they come in on the 6th um, before acting on, on these proposed rules. Uh, and given that this rules implementation process right now could occur in the final two months of open enrollment, uh, again, in the state with the largest rate of uninsured in the nation, I hope that this process can be deferred uh, until after March 31st. This agency's mission should be above election year politics, and if elected officials think that attacking the ACA will help them win an election, I'd completely respect their right to do that, and that's why we have elections. But what, what, we can't, what I can't respect, and none of us should tolerate, are people using their offices to pressure a public agency to adopt punitive, overreaching, and unnecessary regulations in an effort to derail a law that they simply don't like. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Are there any other legislative comments? Okay, then we're going to move on to public testimony, and our first card is from Sister J.T. Dwyer. Good morning, Commissioner and Council. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Sister J.T. Dwyer. I'm an advocacy and outreach consultant with the Seton Healthcare family. Seton's mission is to care for and improve the health of those we serve with a special concern for the poor and vulnerable. Those who could not afford health insurance in the past are surely among the very vulnerable, and for them we have immense concern. We are the largest provider of health care services in Central Texas with over 90 clinical facilities, which include hospitals, clinics, health centers, that particularly target caring for the uninsured and underinsured. In the last fiscal year for which we have figures, Seton provided $397,863,000 of charity care to this uninsured and underinsured population in Central Texas. We also have a keen interest in the Health Exchange Navigator Program, especially in view of our mission. We thank the Texas Department of Insurance for its efforts to be sure Texas citizens' private health information is protected. This is very important. However, we have some definite concerns about the proposed rules which your document states is to help protect Texas consumers by ensuring the security of their private information and ensuring the uh, and ensuring that they are able to apply for affordable health coverage under the federally run health benefit exchange. I would like to outline for you just two of the concerns that Seton has, although we have many others. First, related to section 19.4015. This would prohibit an entity or individual from using the term navigator in a name, website address, or title, or from implying that the entity or individual is a navigator unless that entity or individual is registered as 28 TAC Chapter 19 Subchapter W of, uh, what happened to page 2? Uh, that uh, requires that. Currently, the term navigator is commonly used in various health care settings. In 2005, Congress passed the Patient Navigator Outreach and Chronic Disease Prevention Act. That's Public Law 109-18. Over $25 million in grant money was awarded between 2005 and 2010 for the development of various patient navigator programs. 
Those navigators work with patients and families to help them at many points along the healthcare continuum. Disease research, understanding their bills, finding doctors, understanding treatment and care options, accompanying them to visits, serving as a coach and quarterback of their health care team, working with family members and caregivers, mobilizing resources, managing medical paperwork, and many other key acts which help individuals navigate our U.S. health care systems, which too often is complicated, confusing, and not integrated. At Seton, we have many different job titles which use the word navigator. Some nurse navigators, psychosocial navigators, cancer navigators, outreach navigators, OB navigators, that's just a few. Other Texas hospitals do too. The term navigator as used in healthcare did not originate with the Affordable Care Act or with the marketplace. We need TDI to explain why it thinks it can require anyone who uses the term navigator in their name, in their website address, or in their title to have to register, pay a fee, and come under the aegis of TDI. These navigators at hospitals existed before the passage of ACA and are not helping people apply for health care coverage through the health benefit exchange. They do not perform any functions that should fall under the purview of TDI regulations, but they have used the term navigator in their title for years. Secondly, Section 19.4003 states, Subchapter W would apply to any individual or entity providing navigator services in Texas on or after March 1, 2014. We have a serious concern with the scope you give to the definition of navigator services. For example, TDI's rules, the proposed rules, state that persons and organizations explaining how health coverage affordability programs work, as well as explaining health insurance concepts related to qualified health plans, including premiums, cost sharing, networks, or essential health benefits, are providing navigator services. This means they would be subject to these rules and regulations. We believe the department is overreaching in making rules apply to people who are only giving information and education which help the uninitiated or confused understand the foreign world of health insurance terms. We do not believe it's helpful, nor does it serve the best interest of those who need assistance in understanding health insurance concepts that are unfamiliar to have people whose function it is to educate them work under these proposed rules. Also, as I read the rules, they would apply to any neighbor who helps his neighbor understand some concepts like <clears throat> deductibles, premiums, and co-pays. They would be subject to these rules. Surely, Commissioner, you cannot mean this. We believe the rules should apply to those who have access to a person's private information, not to those who are doing only education. There are many groups in Texas, such as Get Covered America, various Texas interfaith organizations, who do only outreach and education on ACA. Let me emphasize that these entities do not have access to people's private information. You have stated that the purpose of the rules is to help protect the Texas consumers by ensuring the security of their private information and ensuring that they are able to apply for affordable health coverage under the federally run health benefit exchange. Yet, by defining navigator services as you do, TDI is applying the proposed rules to people and organizations that are only doing promotion, education, and outreach and have no access to that private information of those to whom they are interacting. We need the department to justify 
why individuals or organizations <clears throat> supplying only information and outreach concerning health insurance concepts or affordability programs need to fall under these proposed rules. With the high percentage of uninsured Texans, we at Seton want to see TDI work in concert with individuals and organizations to help our citizens understand health insurance terms and to be able, able to safely select affordable coverage for themselves and their families. Let not TDI put obstacles in the way of those trying to educate our citizens, particularly those Texans who have not previously had health care coverage. Please realize that the term navigator has been used in the health care area for more than 15 years. If you need to limit those who use the term ACA navigator and have them register, that is one thing. But to say that no one can use the term navigator in their name or title is overreach. Thank you very much for your attention and the opportunity to express some of our concerns. There are many others. Thank you, Sister Dwyer. Please submit the other additional comments. We I'm make sure. Her, so I couldn't hear her. I'm sorry. I just want to make sure that we get the rest of your comments as well, if you'll submit those in writing. We'll be submitting some written comments, and we possibly will come back on the 6th with other points in the rules that we are very concerned about. Thank you very much. I appreciate I it. I realize that, that the people who write these rules really are never been on the ground and worked in this environment. And, and I think you're all of good heart. I know we had a good meeting with um, Ms. Walker and her key staff in July, and we tried to help educate them a little bit. Um, but we need to work together. Well, we need to work together for the good of our Texans. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next. Ladies and gentlemen, please try and refrain commenting either negatively or positively. Uh, a lot of people feel strongly on both sides of the issue, and we're just trying to run everything very quietly and calmly, although I do appreciate your kind gesture. Next, we're going to hear from Tim McKinney. Are you ready? Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and comment. I will be commenting in opposition of the rules and regulations as proposed. And I've already submitted my uh, uh, written statement. My name is Tim McKinney, and I am CEO of the United Way of Tarrant County, which is the lead organization of the CHIMES Consortium. CHIMES is an acronym for Consumer Health Insurance Marketplace Enrollment Services. The consortium was awarded a federal grant of $5.9 million to provide ACA navigators in 220 counties in, in Texas. The consortium currently consists of 16 organizations, two United Ways, two councils of governments, and 12 community-based organizations including the City of Houston and the Community Council of Greater Dallas. And I must point out the Chance Consortium is totally nonpartisan and is not involved in electioneering. All member organizations have long and successful histories in serving Texans in need. They are financially stable and sound, which should negate the requirement to maintain and secure evidence of financial responsibility as proposed. Most of the consortium member organizations have 20 or more years of experience assisting consumers by providing information about eligibility, benefits, and enrollment in Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, and SNAP. They serve their communities through TDI-regulated programs such as HICAP and community partners. The Chimes Consortium currently employs 158 navigators in Texas and has found success with the sub-grantees employing qualified navigators, many of whom have backgrounds as high-cap benefit counselors that are regulated by TDI. Each of the consortium members have years of experience in safeguarding personal information. 
Most consortium members have staff certified by the TDI as high-cap counselors who provide information about both public and private health insurance. Navigators are trained on how to recognize, prevent, and report any potential fraudulent activity. As a federal navigator grant recipient, we are closely monitored by CMS through the Center, Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Over, Oversight, or SOSILE. The navigator certification training process requires registration of all navigators that is maintained by SOSILE. The navigator and grantee organization receive a copy of the official certificate. State level navigator registration should be free and mirror the registration requirements of other similar benefits counseling programs that are regulated by TDI such as HICAP or community partners. Because of our experience in the hiring practices of our organizations, the consortium members agreed to go above and beyond the federal requirements and implement level one background checks on all navigators. The level one background check identifies individuals who have been convicted of a felony and other criminal activity, including fraud. We feel that the standard level one background check is sufficient to protect the consumer from being exposed to individuals with previous criminal activity. The federal required navigator training lacks state specific information regarding Texas Medicaid enrollment. However, the requirement of 13 hours of Texas Medicaid training exceeds the requirements of HICAP and Community Partners Program. The utilization of existing free web-based training such as the Community Partners Program is sufficient for navigators to help consumers understand their options for Texas Medicaid enrollment. Again, navigators are not determining eligibility for Medicaid. They are simply helping consumers complete applications and providing referrals when appropriate to the Medicaid agency as well as CMS to proceed with their enrollment. The 13 hours of privacy requirements and 14 hours of ethics far exceed the educational requirements of other benefit counseling programs. Procedures for handling personal identifiable, identifiable information are included in the standard operating procedures manual for navigators. Navigator training also contains a section dedicated to the protection of personally identifiable information and a test which must be passed in order to receive certification. In addition, navigators will not retain or utilize individual contact information and personal identifiable information is returned to the consumer. Nothing other than a consent form is kept by our navigators. In addition to the federal training and standard operating procedures, CHIMES Consortium Navigators are required to complete one and a half hours of business associate HIPAA training with Texas HB 300 information. TDI has regulated Medicare benefits counselors for years, some of whom are in the CHIMES Consortium, and in our experience, have had few complaints regarding the improper use of consumer information. We ask TDI to provide sufficient evidence of past instances to support the basis for such strict, stringent standards on Affordable Care Act navigators. The budgeting funding of our grant is limited in terms of what we can provide to the overwhelming number of uninsured persons in the state of Texas. The potential additional expense of state registration fees, fingerprint background checks, and additional fee-based education requirements will create grant budget deficiencies with this grant cycle. At the high end, cost could exceed $145,000 for associated cost of 158 navigators. The people who will be hurt by the proposed cost increases are the people who we are supposed to be serving, those who are currently uninsured. Additionally, managing a federal grant can be a time-consuming process that requires multiple approval levels for access to funding as well as modifying budgeted line items. To comply with any potential state rules, that will require 
funding from the federal grant, we will require at least two months lead time to receive the proper approvals. The Times Consortium requests that implementation of any state required regulations and fees coincide with the next grant cycle in August 2014 so that we are able to place additional state costs within the federal budgeted grant amounts. Finally, the Chimes Navigators are fulfilling their duties and responsibilities extraordinarily well. I request that you not oppose additional rules and regulations that are extreme and unnecessary and that will have a negative impact on those consumers who we are trying to serve. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come to you and provide comments. Thank you very much. Next we're going to hear from Jacqueline West. Thank you, Ms. West. Yes. My name is Jacqueline West. I'm the Deputy Director of the Community Council of Greater Dallas, and we are a sub-recipient of the Chimes Consortium grant through the United Way of Tarrant County. According to the Federal Register, Volume 78, Number 137, a navigator is defined as an individual attached to a navigator entity who is trained and able to help consumers, small businesses, and their employees as they look for health care options through the marketplace, including completing eligibility and enrollment forms. These individuals and organizations are required to be unbiased. Their services are free to consumers. Navigators are not selling insurance. They're educating consumers and answering questions about the marketplace. There's a difference between individuals who are working under a navigator entity, such as our nonprofit, the Community Council of Greater Dallas, and people who have knowledge about the Affordable Care Act without a connection to any navigator entity who also help others. Many of the proposed rules seem to neglect the fact that navigator entities have safeguards in place that are effective in protecting consumers while providing the valuable service of educating clients about their health insurance options through the Affordable Care Act marketplace. Employment of navigators under nonprofit organizations mean that they are subject to employment terms. We advertise the positions for qualified applicants. The resumes are reviewed and potential employees are interviewed. We run criminal background checks that include all 50 states. Affordable Care Act navigators attached to navigator entities must be hired and employed under all the HR laws, organizational policies and procedures, terms of the Sorbanes-Oxley, and terms of the Affordable Care Act. Inasmuch, they must have uh, show an ID, show that they're in the country legally. We keep a carbon copy of their Social Security card on file. We keep a carbon copy of their driver's license or other official picture ID on file. They have to read and agree to our conflict of interest policy. They have to read and agree to our fraud policy. They have to read and agree to all terms of employment. They have their references checked. They must wear our community council badge. They carry their CMS certifications at all times to show that they completed their navigator training. They have to undergo HIPAA confidentiality training. They adhere to our electronic communications policies. We also have organizational assurances in place as a nonprofit organization. We don't need the additional financial requirements as outlined in the proposed rules. We already have an umbrella liability insurance policy. We have directors and officers insurance. We have additional riders for events off property. And we sign all the certifications that come along with these grants, certificates of disbarment, no losses of licenses. We're not delinquent on our child support. And we're subject of the terms of the Patriot Act. The proposed rules require extensive, unnecessary training. Training already exists for Texas Medicaid and CHIP. It does not need to be developed. We employ high-cap high counselors as well, three of whom are certified navigators, and we also have CHIP outreach specialists, five of whom are certified application counselors who help citizens with the enrollment process in Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP. HICAP and CHIPPER workers already receive annual training from CMS and TDHHS. They receive regular updates as well. Our navigators have weekly calls with the Chimes Consortium. We have weekly calls with CMS. CHIP workers have monthly coalition meetings and updates from their contract managers. HIPAA training is already offered to, to Affordable Care Act navigators and is also included in the HICAP training. All training needed already exists and should not be reinvented. There should not be a charge for training. 
diverting funds to bureaucratic registrations and additional newly created training is a poor investment of taxpayer dollars. It will only result in fewer navigators being hired and spending less time with uninsured clients. High cap counselors and CHIP outreach workers perform the same types of duties as certified navigators, yet they have never been subject to the proposed rules by TDI. Finally, navigators seem to be perceived as a threat to the livelihood of licensed insurance agents. However, the certified navigators work with populations that generally do not overlap with those that licensed insurance agents traditionally serve. We're serving Texas's most vulnerable population. We serve clients who have low literacy rates. They have language barriers. They have transportation barriers. They have low income. They live in underserved communities. They have limited computer literacy, and they lack a history of insurance. In conclusion, I would like to say that navigators attached to navigated entities are doing a great job and they are sufficiently regulated by the Affordable Care Act law and their employers. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, Ms. West. Okay, can we hear from Martha Blaine next? Good morning. My name is Martha Blaine. I'm the Executive Director of the Community Council of Greater Dallas, and I'm going to touch on a few points that Jacqueline West, our Deputy Director, uh, did not cover. Um, Community Council is a 70-year-old organization that has been serving North Texas in a variety of ways, including benefits counseling and helping the uninsured for over 25 years in that capacity. We also run the Office of Aging, we run the 211 service, and we have coalitions on various health issues, including obesity and uh, immunization. So we are not new in this field, and we met the federal requirements that a navigator entity have a familiarity with those parts of the public that need to be served. So we have met that and exceeded it. As Jacqueline said, we're a subcontractor under the Chimes Coalition, and we currently em employ full, uh, 10 full-time ACA navigators, three high-cap counselors who are cross-trained as ACA navigators, and five CHIPRA outreach enrollment specialists who are cross-trained as ACA certified application counselors. I can't begin to tell you how many years of experience that represents. Well over 45 among our staff. These are not newbies. These are not people who do not know what they're doing. We have been uh, cited and received national awards for the work that we do in outreach on CHIP and on Medicaid. We know our business. I want to give you four big picture points because you'll, you've heard specifics from Jacqueline and you will from others. The first question and the big picture point I would make is the definition of navigator. Sister J.T. Dwyer touched on that, that that word is a generic word that has belonged and been used widely throughout um, healthcare industry. The federal law defines who an ACA navigator is very clearly and says it is a person attached to a navigator entity and or a navigator entity. Those are the groups that receive the federal grants, not others. That is who the law is referring to, not other folks. If we look at the parallels in the other systems that are already in existence, which we just mentioned, high cap counselors for Medicare, CHIPRA outreach, community partners who are doing other benefits from Medicaid, CHIP, uh, TANF, and SNAP. Those programs already have all of their bureaucracy training and infrastructure in place. This does not need to be any different. There are plenty of people in our communities who help people understand CHIP, who help people understand food stamps, who help people understand Medicare Part D and which plan is going to cover your drugs and which isn't. None of those folks are doing enrollment. They are helping people understand, they are answering questions at whatever level of friend or colleague or professional they are. But they are not doing enrollment. And the law states that those who can do enrollment, who can actually insist uh, on helping a client enroll, are navigators under the ACA, and they are attached to a navigator entity. And you have just heard all the provisions and protections and policies that we as that navigator entity have in place. 
We run $7 million worth of federal and state grants to our organization, and I can't begin to tell you how many monitors are in our shop every week looking at every phase of our operation. And if there was a problem, we would have had to report that to you and to everybody else on Earth, as well as the media. The third point, we do have a lot of really dedicated folk in our communities who want to help people understand this new change in how you can get insurance if you don't have it. And there's a role for all of them to play, but it is not as a certified navigator. And I want to point out one piece about the certified navigator status. When the navigators begin their training and they go through the online training and they take the test and they pass the test and they get their certificate that says they passed their test, they are not a certified navigator. Not yet. They have to take the results of that test and file that with the unique identifier number that's issued to the navigator entities. And they file that with CMS, and CMS sends back the certification. So simply completing the training successfully does not make you a certified navigator. So I want us to be very careful how we use these words. It's become a catch-all word for anybody who's trying to help. And obviously, we don't want people giving false information. But I also don't think that some of the rules that you've proposed are appropriate for those of us who are professionals who've been working in this field for 20 and 35 years successfully without a problem. The financial questions that you're asking of us, for the community council alone, will be over $25,000 a year. I don't have $25,000 to devote to this. And I can't take it from another program because that's fraud. Okay? And I can't go out and raise $25,000 between now and March the 1st to pay for things that we've already done. We've already done the background check. We do not need fingerprinting. We know if someone's a criminal. We know where to find them. They're on our payroll. We have every form of identifier on there. And our grant manager, United Way of Tarrant County, has a registration of every single navigator that we have licensed through the state. And CMS has that. So you're going to create another registration file of the things that we already have? I mean, that's already on file, just like our high cap counselors are on file. That's already there. And our, our files are open to the public. You can come at any time. We're completely transparent. All of our hiring practices that you've heard of exceed those that are being proposed. And that's normal for a nonprofit. So if the concern is about individuals who are not attached to a navigator entity, they are not navigators. Do not use the word navigator, the certified ACA navigator, and impose rules on us that we have already exceeded and met in a way that is appropriate for a nonprofit. Putting up a surety bond is not an appropriate thing for us to do, nor are we allowed to take monies out of one fund and put them on escrow or somewhere else. We're not allowed to do that. We don't, have, we don't have money we can do that with. But we do carry very high liability insurance, officers and directors insurance, and every other kind of insurance known to man. Our employees are totally covered. So are our volunteers. That is the nature of being a nonprofit corporation. With 70 years of history behind us, we're a solid organization, as are the other members of the Chimes Coalition. And I would urge you to look at this overview of how we're defining those people who are helping. There is a role for people who want to help but are not doing the enrollment procedure. Those who are actually helping someone enroll are certified ACA navigators, having met the federal law, having met all of our terms of our grant, and having met all of the uh, licensing and requirements of being an employee. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you for this opportunity to address you. Thank you very much for your time. Okay, next we have three ladies from top. My understanding is we want Cecilia Fontenot first, Liliana Ruiz second, and Allison Brim third. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. So Cecilia, please come. Right here. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Cecilia Fontenot. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before you this morning. I want to implore you to look at the whole picture, not just the politics. Please do not continue to put barriers against the navigators. Should not the barriers that you are 
putting against the navigator been put at the beginning, not at the 11th hour. I believe that the majority of the navigators are qualified. I had not had insurance for eight years. Now, come January the 1st, I will have insurance. I have ailments. I have, I'm a diabetic. I have hypertension, high cholesterol. Don't you think that I need insurance to help me gain back some of my health? And I do realize that I have lost a lot of health through these issues. I believe that navigators are needed to help the people get through the process of getting health care. Some people are unable to navigate through that whole process, so they need assistance. So again, I implore you to look at the whole picture. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Do we have Liliana? Yeah, I'm sorry. Liliana Ruiz. Hello. Uh, thank you for having me here and giving me the chance to put my word out there. Um, I'm almost 30 years old. I have two kids. I, I'm a Hispanic. Hispanic people have the problem of not getting the right income. Uh, low income is a big issue in our community. Um, I have two family members that passed away of, because of cancer. One 43-year-old, my aunt, and a cousin, a 17-year-old. And they died because they didn't have insurance. They couldn't go to a doctor every day and check their self or whenever they needed to go to a doctor. I have a 16-year-old and an 11-year-old. I want to get checked. I need to get checked. I need insurance. Just like me, everybody else as well. I don't want to leave my kids at early, this early. I don't have nobody to take care of them. I need to get checked. I need for to get this. I need for people to understand that I need somebody. I need a help. And that help is going to be these navigators that can tell me and guide me to everything that I need to do. And as well as all the community, Hispanic community, African Americans that need that help. Not everybody have uh, internet. Not everybody gets paid like y'all do. Everybody has to work so hard sometimes, and we don't understand mostly of the time when they said, when they say, "Hey, uh, y'all can do this in the internet, or y'all can do this on the website, or y'all can go here, y'all can go there." So we do need them. And me, as a Hispanic, I'm begging y'all to let these people help us. That's all they trying to do, help us, help people like us that need this and to understand that we have options. So please don't let these other people stop this opportunity that is given to us now. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, ma'am. Hi. Good morning. My name is Allison Brim, and I'm the statewide organizing director for Texas Organizing Project. We're here today from all over the state to register our opposition to these rules. We hope you do not pass these rules. The Texas Organizing Project has 30,000 members and supporters. These are working families from across the state, a large number of whom are uninsured and are eligible for the marketplace. You just heard from two of them. Um, nearly 100 are here today in person, woke up at 2 in the morning, 3 in the morning, to get on the bus and drive from Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, because this issue is so critical for our communities. The Texas Organizing Project is not a navigator. We do not assist Texans in getting enrolled in the health insurance marketplace directly. However, we do reach Texans in their homes, community, and civic centers and provide Texans with the tools they need to make the best decisions for their family's health care needs, including connecting them to navigators or enrollment assisters. 
As we've heard today, access to affordable health care is not a new issue for hardworking Texas families, and it continues to be a struggle for nearly 6 million families in this state. The Affordable Care Act, as you know, attempts to cut the number of uninsured in our state by three-fourths through giving subsidies or financial aid to Texans to buy their own coverage through the marketplace. Getting insurance is a complicated and difficult process, and that's why navigator organizations are so important to successfully getting Texans the health coverage they need and rightly deserve. These additional rules, fees, and regulations would be a contradiction to a state that prides itself in less government and less interference. Texas has a long history of turning to community organizations to enroll Texas families in health care programs like CHIP, like Medicaid, and these same groups that are navigators now have long been in our communities providing other critical direct services to meet the needs of working families. We have full confidence that they will do the same thing and are doing the same thing with the marketplace. Furthermore, navigators are already under strict federal guidelines and undergo a training regimen before getting cert certified. Additional state rules and regulations are needless and burdensome to these organizations that are doing such great work. They appear to be nothing more than political fodder for state leadership trying to delay, distract, and otherwise put up barriers to Texans getting access to affordable health care. In our experience working with navigator organizations in Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, and the Rio Grande Valley, these organizations are doing fantastic work in an already difficult climate and need all of our support to get the over 4 million eligible Texans enrolled in coverage. The last thing we need in our great state where we have the highest percentage of uninsured families in the country is additional roadblocks stopping Texans from getting the health care they need. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, can I ask Misty Baker from IIAT to come up next? Thank you. All right, Misty, can we get you... Let's do that. Can you give us one more minute? Okay, good. Go for it, Misty. All right. Good morning. My name is Misty Baker. I'm the Director of Health Insurance Services for the Independent Insurance Agents of Texas. IAT has consistently voiced concern about consumer protections under the Affordable Care Act. We believe that navigators should be educated to help consumers through the process of application for health insurance in the federal marketplace. Navigators should be required to protect the private and financial records of every Texan they serve. In this regard, thorough background checks are especially important. In addition to adequate initial training, navigators should be required to continuously update their knowledge of the ACA and the marketplace delivery system as it involved, evolves and meet appropriate privacy standards. Consumers deserve to be guided by an educated, financially responsible, registered navigator during this enrollment process. Thank you. Thank you. Now can we have Senator Donna Campbell? Thank you. Good morning. It's great to see you. Um, I wanted to take this opportunity to express just my concern regarding the navigators for the Affordable Health Care Act and um, throw my encouragement and support behind the Texas Department of Insurance in your scrutiny of the navigators. The 83rd legislature passed Senate Bill 1795, and it was signed by the governor on June 14th. The bill was passed to provide consumer protection by requiring that navigators, as established by the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, have training necessary to advise and guide the public through the process of finding the most appropriate health insurance options available to them. Since this bill was passed and signed, you have, you meaning the Texas Department of Insurance, have engaged in a process to determine whether or not the federal rules and regulations for navigators are sufficient. 
after an involved and thorough process. The agency, I believe, has determined that the federal rules are insufficient and that the state, a state rule is necessary, and I strongly agree. Ultimately, the Affordable Health Care Act, in my opinion, should be repealed. Implementation has caused or has exposed the law's many uh, intrinsic flaws and faulty assumptions, just one of which is an ill-defined uh, navigator program. Until the Affordable Care Act is repealed or defunded, however, Texas must immediately act to enforce regulations to address the many insufficiencies of the federal rules. One such insufficiency is that privacy standards are not as robust as they should be, and to remedy this, the proposed rule requires that navigators undergo training on state privacy standards before they're allowed to register with the state. Federal training does not include information specific to the Texas Medicaid program or ethics. The state rule, however, will require navigator training on both of those matters. Navigators in their current state are clearly not working. Already there have been reports of navigators encouraging tax fraud, lacking proper training, not going through criminal background checks, failing to safeguard private consumer information, blatantly disregarding their own rules. In many ways, the shortcomings of federal rules imposed on navigators are as big a failure, in my opinion, as the Obamacare website, and pose a bigger threat to consumers, especially our disabled and the elderly. My district, Senate District 25, has expressed numerous concerns for their privacy and invasion of their privacy. Hearings by the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform revealed navigators and assisters pose real threats to the safety of consumers personal identifiable information, including their social security number, yearly income, and other sensitive information. Federal HHS officials have admitted in sworn testimony that they do not have the necessary buzz budget to visit navigator organizations, vet them, and provide proper oversight. Federal HHS officials have also admitted in sworn testimony that the public has no way to check or verify credible navigators against the official list. There's no way to make sure that someone who presents themselves as a navigator is legitimate. Therefore, the potential for fraud, for fake organizations and criminals to commit fraud is just limitless. Nothing in the federal law, rule, or regulation prohibits a convicted felon from serving as a navigator, a fact that was publicly confirmed by Secretary Sebelius on November 6. Fingerprinting and background checks at the state level are imperative to ensure that Texans' personal information is handled appropriately. And even with that, I might add, there's no guarantee it's going to be handled appropriately. Clearly, those who say your personal information is safe and none of these reforms are necessary are the same people who claim that you can keep your health plan if you want it, and you can keep the same doctor if you want. It's just empty promises are just that, and we've got to be vigilant about protecting our citizens. I'd like to thank you, Commissioner Rathgerber and Associate Commissioner Jamie Walker, and all that the Texas Department of Insurance uh, staff, everything that you're doing for your outstanding work in trying to protect Texas and examining the significant insufficiencies that the federal regulators, navigator rules um, are showing us. You've adhered to the process that I believe the intent of our Senate Bill 1795 intended. I ask that you please protect, uh, or excuse me, please proceed to adopt um, this draft rule on navigators as soon as possible in order to protect Texas consumers. I look forward to an opportunity to work with you on any occasion that I can to help safeguard, put in safeguards for these navigators to protect Texans. Okay, so with that, I will say Merry Christmas and thank you very much. Thank you. I'm glad to see you. It's good to see you. All right. V, are you ready? You want to come up? V Moorhead next.
Good morning. My name is B. Moorhead. I'm the director of Texas Impact. We're a statewide interfaith organization. Um, we are, uh, I didn't mark opposed or support, we oppose some but not all of the provisions of the proposed rule, and we support some but not all of the provisions of the proposed world rule. We appreciate the opportunity to offer comments on these draft rules. Um, we believe that the proposed rules include provisions that are intended to improve the quality of information available to consumers regarding health insurance. But we believe that some of the proposed provisions would create an undue burden for the Texas nonprofit community without improving conditions for consumers. We also believe that the proposed rule falls short of articulating the department's enforcement authority and strategy for protecting consumers from bad actors. We want to help improve the rule, and so we have some comments and we also have some recommendations for um, ways to improve it. First, we understand that the proposed rule is intended to exempt volunteers who are participating in the Texas Health and Human Services Commission's Community Partner Program because the rule exempts individuals who are regulated by another state agency already. We support that provision, and we also support the provision that would exempt certified application counselors. We're concerned that the rule does not give clear notice to those who are implicated by the rule and could be read broadly to include some individuals whose activities do not merit TDI oversight. For example, the rule could be read to include family members, friends, or members of the clergy who offer casual personal assistance or even who engage in conversation about health insurance concepts and choices around the dinner table. The rule also could be read to cover private sector human resource specialists working for firms that elect to offer health insurance through the Federal Small Business Health Insurance Exchange, SHOP. So therefore, we recommend first that the rule be amended to clarify that only individuals covered by the, the only individuals covered by the rule are those who are described by the 42 U.S.C. 18031, the Affordable Care Act Navigator Program, this would exempt family members' casual assistance and conversations within the faith community. Also, we recommend that the department conduct further research regarding private sector human resources staff, including focus groups and surveys. And you, we would recommend that the department consider holding a stakeholder meeting on shop before finalizing the proposed rule. The proposed rule attempts to monopolize the use of the term navigator to mean only those who are providing ACA-related activities. However, existing state laws and rules for unrelated programs already use the term navigator. For instance, the Community Partner Programs Enabling Legislation Government Code uh, 531.751 stipulates that individuals volunteering in the community partner program are referred to as navigators, and also patient navigators is a term of art used in the Medicaid Star Plus program already. So Texas Impact recommends that the rule be amended to clarify that the prohibition on unauthorized use of the term navigator only applies within the context of health insurance application assistance and it doesn't apply to other state agencies' use of the term or other uses of the term that are occurring in unrelated sections of the law. With respect to registration, the proposed registration process is anticipated to be expensive and time-consuming, but most of the cost appears to be associated with the 40 hours of training that's required in addition to the already long federally required training. If the registration requirements are separated from the training and testing requirements, the registration requirements alone seem reasonable and would provide a valuable backstop for the state to ensure that individuals participating in the federal program don't have unrelated factors such as prior felony convictions that the federal program might have failed to uncover. So we support that registration provision. The proposed rule requires navigators in Texas to receive training on various topics, including state-specific information about Medicaid, that go beyond federal navigator training. Conceptually, this doesn't pose us any problem. In fact, it is Texas Impact's position that the more Texas, Texans understand about Texas Medicaid, the better the Medicaid program can serve our state's health care needs. However, the proposed rules prescribe a more or less complete reinvention of a wheel that is already operating smoothly in Texas, and it would create a great unnecessary cost to Texas taxpayers. The proposed rule would require navigator training to be developed and implemented by an outside vendor, despite the fact that the Health and Human Services Commission already provides training on Texas Medicaid to professionals at various levels as well as to the general public. 
This training has already been developed at state expense and it's now provided by HHSC at no charge. The cost of the private vendor training is expected to fall entirely on navigators and their organizations. Those dollars will be paid in most cases out of federal navigator grants, which are funded with tax dollars. So, in effect, the rule would require the nonprofits use federal tax dollars to pay a private company to provide a service that duplicates one that our own state Medicaid agency already provides for free. Worse, it's possible that the development of the new training materials could result in additional costs to HHSC because that agency would be the source of the information the vendor would have to use to develop the materials and they could be called upon to donate staff time to edit or proofread the vendor's materials for accuracy. So the requirement to, print, to have a private vendor to do what the state is already doing for free is not explained in the justification for the proposed rule. Texas Impact recommends that text the TDI remove the current language related to training and testing from the proposed rule and instead adopt language that simply reflects standards for the proficiencies that navigators should possess. Further, we recommend that TDI work cooperatively with HHSC and other relevant state agencies to develop and implement training and testing programs that address the need for additional expertise for navigators that TDI has identified and likely would like them to have. The proposed rule would require navigator organizations to maintain financial responsibility by posting bond, creating an escrow account, or maintaining a liability policy. You've already heard uh, a lot from the people from North Texas about this. It is likely that the organizations that are receiving federal navigator grants already have liability policies in place. The proposed rules don't indicate that TDI has conducted any specific stakeholder research to clarify the types of policies that nonprofits typically would maintain as part of a federal grant project. We recommend that you solicit stakeholder input specific to the financial responsibility portion of the rule and provide justification for the three choices that are offered, the escrow, the surety bond, and the liability. In particular, the justification should state how the required liability insurance compares to nonprofit policies typically available in the market. And we recommend that TDI consider the role that board liability insurance plays in nonprofit financial responsibility models because that's not something that's the same for a for profit model. The proposed rule pro prohibits navigators from providing substantive information about benefits, which is a task that's already specifically required by the federal law. The proposed rule could infringe on religious freedom in this way by constraining the faith community's ability to discuss specific types of insurance coverage, such as coverage for reproductive health services, with congregants. So we recommend that the rule be amended to delete the pro prohibition against navigators providing substantive information about benefits, both to prevent a conflict with federal law and to prevent a conflict relating to religious freedom. Finally, despite the amount of detail in the rule regarding navigator registration and the penalties for failure to register, the proposed rule contains no explicit provisions regarding remediation for consumers who are defra defrauded by fake navigators, nor does it contain any provisions regarding public information or education to ensure that consumers know what navigators are supposed to do. And finally, the proposed rule doesn't have any due process provisions for individuals or groups who are accused of violating the rule, despite the fact that a false accusation could lead to loss of federal funding to the entity. So our final recommendation is that the rule be amended to provide due process for navigator individuals and entities who are accused of administrative violations under the rule. Again, we appreciate the opportunity and we look forward to working with you. Thanks. Thanks, B. I appreciate it. Okay, next up is Charles Bailey. The opportunity to provide comments today. Uh, like B, I uh, signed up both in opposition and in support of the rules. There are certain provisions that our association does support, and I'll comment on that. Uh, there's also uh, some aspects of the rules that we have concerns with. I want to start with this. Uh, each year, uh, Texas hospitals provide over $6 billion in uncompensated services to patients who lack health insurance coverage. Doctors, other providers also provide substantial levels of un uncompensated care, but hospitals often have become the safety net for the uninsured uh, who are sick or, in or injured. They provide the needed services in when patients need those services, and hospital staff also often will assist patients in enrolling for Medicaid and other governmental programs. So these rules are important Certainly reducing the number of uninsured patients uh, in the state of Texas is important. 
and navigators have an important role in, in, in promoting coverage. These rules are also important to hospitals because as we read the rules, um, many hospital staff will be providing services, uh, navigator services, and they will come within the scope of the rule. You've heard a lot of testimony today, so I'll try to keep my comments brief, but I want to focus really on one key point of the rules, and, and others have, have mentioned this as well, uh, the applicability of the rules or the scope of the rules. Uh, our association does support some of the exemptions provided in the proposed rules uh, for those entities that are providing assistance under a federal or state law other than the ACA. Uh, if I've read this provision correctly, that would apply to some of our Medicaid outstation or eligibility workers that provide an alternative for eligibility enrollment uh, rather than the, the Medicaid offices. Uh, our association also supports the exemption from registration uh, for those uh, organizations that have been uh, approved as a certified application counselor. A number of Texas hospitals have become a CAC, and it doesn't make a lot of sense to subject these hospitals to additional state regulation. The primary concern issue I'd like to raise today, it's more of a legal issue, but I think uh, an important issue, uh, and that is that the rules are overly broad and will subject to state regulation a lot, much larger group of individuals and organizations than was required by Senate Bill 1795. As you've heard, uh, the rules require registration uh, and regulation of any individual or entity that provides navigator services. And under the, the proposed definition of navigator services, if you provide any of those designated services, whether it be providing information, uh, explaining eligibility, or assisting with enrollment, you are considered a navigator and must meet all the rule requirements. So as I read the rules, uh, a hospital business office uh, staff member who is explaining how health insurance works, how they might gain coverage under Medicaid or CHIP or other governmental programs, including the federal exchange, uh, in that circumstance, the hospital would be required to be registered as a navigator. I think several people have mentioned that if an individual were to assist a family member or friend in gaining coverage under the ACA, they also would meet the definition of a navigator and would have to be registered. From my review of, of the law, I don't believe that is uh, what is required. Under Senate Bill 795, a navigator is defined as an individual or an entity performing the, the activities and duties of navigators as described in the federal law, both the ACA and the, and the federal regulations. The federal regulations provide that an entity that serves an, as a navigator must carry out at least certain specified duties. And the listing of, of duties in the federal regulation is not exactly but very similar to the listing of services required under the state rules. What I want to emphasize here is that the federal regulation states that an entity must carry out at least these specified duties, the five or six designated duties, which in my mind suggests that an entity must provide all of the required services in order to be considered a navigator. Or stated differently, if an entity or an individual does not provide all the required duties, it cannot be considered a navigator under the federal regulation. This also means, in my judgment, that if an entity or an individual is not providing all those required services, they do not meet the definition of a navigator under the state law, Senate Bill 7095, and should not be subject to the state rules. Uh, so in written comments we will be providing in the, in the next several days, we will suggest a number of recommendations, recommended changes to the definition of an individual navigator and to navigator entity that would clarify that in order to be subject to these regulations, the entity or the individual would have to meet, would have to provide all of the required uh, services under the federal regulation and under the state law. That will substantially reduce the scope of this regulation. I know there may be concerns about that because of the representations by HSS that there's no authority by the federal government to regulate more than those entities that are uh, approved as federal navigators. But if you look at the plain language of the statute, I think that 
uh, is a fair reading of the law and would substantially reduce a lot of the opposition you are hearing today because it would dramatically reduce uh, the number of entities that would be subject to the rules. So I'll stop with that. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Charles. I appreciate it. Next up is Stacy Pogue. Stacy, I can find you. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Stacy Pogue. I'm a senior policy analyst with the Center for Public Policy Priorities, and though we work on several additional issues now, we were founded more than 25 years ago by Benedictine Sisters to work on improving access to health care for the poor in Texas. I want to thank the commissioner and the staff for putting in a lot of hard work on this rule. I recognize that there's a really steep learning curve when you get into the weeds of community service organizations and federal bureaucracy, although I'm sure you guys know about that anyway. Um, but I realize this is, um, there's been a lot of work put in on this. Um, I'm going to raise some issues that we have concerns about, but I think they're all issues that can be fixed. And we will be submitting formal comments that I'm really sad we don't have ready today. Um, but we will get those in, of course, before the deadline with some suggestions on how um, the rule can be fixed to make sure that it fosters both really important consumer protections and a robust navigator program. Um, I'm concerned about a number of things that you've already heard about, you know, a realistic timeline for navigators to come into compliance so the program doesn't have to cease operation, um, the ability of navigators to help people understand benefits, uh, kitchen table assisters. But I'm going to limit my comments to three areas. Um, the relationship of the rule to Medicaid and CHIP outreach enrollment, the definition of navigator services, and um, the, the different uh, various training components, uh, requirements of, of in-person assisters. Uh, the definition in the proposed rule of enrollment assistance is, is also a bullet under the um, navigator services. Is essentially, I'm just going to summarize it, help with the application for programs in the exchange. And I think it's really important to note um, that that application and those programs in the exchange aren't just private health insurance in the exchange. That application is for Medicaid and CHIP and subsidized marketplace insurance. All are available through the exchange. So under the Affordable Care Act with no wrong door, um, there's no way now to go to an HHSC benefits office or a food stamp office and apply just for Medicaid and CHIP. That is also an application for the marketplace. And there's no way, even if you go on healthcare.gov and you think you're applying for private health insurance, that is also an application for Medicaid and CHIP, that those can't be disentangled. Um, and I think that means this rule will have implications for Medicaid and CHIP outreach and enrollment as well. Um, Texas has worked really hard to expand community-based application assistance in Medicaid and CHIP, and you've heard about some of the programs today. Um, we recognize that there's a, an exemption from the rules for groups that are providing um, outreach and assistance in Medicaid and CHIP through specific state authority. But another really important distinction to make is that HHSC has never, and I don't think the legislature has ever, voiced an intention to limit assistance for application uh, assistance in Medicaid and CHIP to just people who are operating under specific state authority. Um, and this rule would do that. It's an important distinction, I think, uh, that HHSC says we're going to put tools and we're going to put trainings out to community-based groups and we're going to invite them to participate with us but not exclude other groups from participating even if they don't um, uh, participate in specific programs. So it's a pretty striking contrast, I think, between the direction HHSC has been heading in for years with community-based groups and the direction this rule takes, which says if you, know, if you don't have an exemption, you are required to jump through the hoops that TDI has put in place um, to provide enrollment assistance with Medicaid and CHIP. The other thing I want to, uh, the second thing I want to talk about is definition of navigator services. We also think that it's incredibly broad. Um, the rule lists six um, activities that navigators perform, uh, essentially defining navigators using those six activities. It is a definition of navigator services, but the definition of navigator is someone who performs the services. So again, it's essentially the definition of navigators. Um, I would point out this language comes from Senate Bill 1795, and it's not in that bill, the definition of a navigator. Rather, it's a checklist for TDI to use when evaluating the federal standards to make sure the federal standards uh, empower navigators to perform those six duties. I think the rule, TDI rule takes it and flips it, and instead of um, saying any uh, navigators need to know how to do this, they say anybody doing one of these things is a navigator in ways that actually makes it not very logical. For example, navigators must avoid conflicts of interest, but not everybody who avoids a conflict of interest is a navigator. CPAs, doctors, lawyers, 
consultants. There are lots of professionals who avoid conflicts of interest. The same with providing culturally competent communication. That in no way is something that um, just navigators do. So that broad definition um, also captures the Center for Public Policy Priorities. I, on behalf of the center, do a lot of public education that explains how health coverage program work, programs work, how they interact, and explains concepts like deductibles and premiums. And I realized that we would not, as a center, have to jump through the expensive and time-consuming hoops of registration, but we would be subject to the rules and wouldn't be able to give advice on comparative benefits. And I just don't think anything in state law contemplated regulating individuals at any level who are just providing basic education and basic information on health insurance or communicating in a culturally appropriate way, for example. Um, so we recommend also that the scope be narrowed with one of the outcomes, the goals being to ensure that somebody who is just doing talking about health insurance, doing nothing more than talking talking about health insurance, that they aren't put under state oversight or uh, run the risk of running afoul of state law. Um, the last thing I want to say is I turned in, we did release a report, posted a report this week that, um, that, that explains some of our key concerns on the rules, and you have heard about them from other people here today, but we have them um, provided to you in writing. But there's a chart in that uh, uh, report that compares the requirements for training and fees uh, to for different application assister types, the Community Partner Program or Medicaid Navigators through HHSC, the HICAP Program, ACA Navigators, uh, Health Insurance Agents, and the proposed rule. And what you'll find is, you know, TDI requires in this rule navigators to take 60 to 70 hours of training. Um, that is completely out of line with every other sister group that we have looked at. That's two to three times as much as federal ACA navigators. It's 15 times as much as Medicaid ACA nav excuse me Medicaid navigators in the community partner program. More than double what HICAP requires. And of course, health insurance agents don't have a training requirement, but an exam requirement. Um, they, don't, they don't have pre-licensure training requirements. Um, and it also appears that the proposal is out of line with other states. And we do not have this analysis complete, but I promise we will finish it before the deadline and get it to you. But I'm looking at what other states with federally facilitated marketplaces have required in their rules. And it looks like TDI requires um, notably more training than any other state we've found at this point. But we'll be able to uh, provide that comparison for you. I want to say that we are not opposed to training in the I areas that TDI identified. It's the um, number of hours that appears excessive and, and the um, what you intend to provide the training, which as other folks have covered, is really a duplication of services and not a wise investment of tax dollars. Um, and, and those are the three I wanted to bring up again. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I really appreciate it. Thanks very much. Um, we have a card from, I believe it's Quatave Harris. Have I mispronounced somebody's name? It's Q-U-T-A-I-V-E Harris. Set that one aside. There's a, the next one is Alterio Welch. Is Alterio Welch here? Next is Maureen Milligan. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was worried I'd done something wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. Um, all right. Good morning, Commissioner and Counselor. My name is Maureen Milligan. I'm the President and CEO of Teaching Hospitals of Texas, and I'm here representing them. Uh, THOD, or Teaching Hospitals of Texas, represents Texas's large urban public hospitals and health systems, four University of Texas health systems, and several affiliated nonprofit systems, including Seton, and uh, other smaller community-funded hospitals and health systems. Our members have a mission that includes ensuring access to care for all Texans with a special focus on vulnerable populations. Our members also, in particular, provide much more than hospital care, um, but community-based primary care and preventive care. You heard Sister JT talk about, I think, Seton alone having, was it 90 or 60 outpatient clinics and, and preventive clinics? 90. So, so our members um, have uh, preventive and primary care out in communities, so broad health systems. We appreciate the department's challenge uh, and the pressures that you are navigating today uh, with different pressures coming from different places. Senate Bill 1795 uh, asks you to provide a state solution to ensure that Texans are able to find and apply for affordable health coverage under any federally run health benefit exchange while helping consumers in the state. At the same time, you've heard concerns about ensuring confidentiality of protected information and ensuring training sufficient to provide accurate assistance. 
I think one of the points I'd like to make is that it is important to emphasize that there may always be individuals who won't perform consistent with requirements, but that does not mean that the requirements are problematic. From a pure logic perspective, to argue otherwise is like saying because some people use firearms inappropriately, their ownership should be more tightly regulated and limited. So today I want to discuss three concerns and our support for some of the, actually two concerns and some of the support for um, the exclusions that you did make and we appreciate your making. First, and you've heard this, just want to emphasize the broad scope and application of the requirements and the definitions of navigator should be more narrowly de uh, defined and applied. For example, the rule as we understand it extends its authority to regulate individuals who are not certified as navigators. And so I'd like to include by reference, if I might, the comments of Sister J.T. B. Moorhead, for example, and Charles Bailey, and others on this point, and recommend something, for example, of the term that's been uh, referenced, like an ACA navigator, to more narrowly define um, your, your targeted population and group. As um, representing my membership, we would want to ensure that the rule would not result in restrictions on anyone doing outreach and education on how health systems work. Many individuals in the healthcare system assist the uninsured, and the underinsured in understanding health care, how to access it, and the benefits of insurance. These services actually improve the efficiency and the cost effectiveness of the health care system by getting people into care, those primary and preventive clinics that, that we operate, sooner and in appropriate settings, and thus actually save the health care system money and Im improve the health of Texans. So limiting information about inappropriate access to insurance coverage has a direct financial impact on local communities currently funding health care for Texans who would otherwise be covered under funded health care options in the exchange and, and therefore limiting the financial burden on Texas communities today. Is that for me? Am I supposed to back up? <laughs> it isn't you. We've gotten an Amber Alert, right. and many of us are on the Amber Alert okay. network, and I apologize. That's there right. is a child missing in Richardson. I, no I'm worries. So sorry. <laughs> I thought I was supposed to back up, but I guess <laughs> We really want to hear from you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I appreciate it. Um, okay, so, so the point really there is, you know, that, that we believe that more information on how to appropriately use and access a health care system will actually help Texas communities uh, who fund, uh, at least in our membership, um, health care costs in their communities. The second concern is the hours and cost of training, and you've heard this, that are, you know, seem to be excessive and may actually work contrary to the intent of SB 1795, um, which is the basis for the rule. Um, you've heard referenced already, and I'll just repeat this uh, example. Currently, Medicaid and SHIP navigators certified by the Commission through the Community Partnership Program. Um, that that training should offer or could offer you a good model of how to achieve your goals uh, without necessarily increasing the regulation, the costs uh, to Texas, while improving the health care and, and financial sustainability of our system. Um, just in the comment, you know, Stacy referenced this document that, that she made, which is really good, you know, the stuff she does. And, and, and the comparison here, if you look at it, the, the requirements, aside from the training for navigators under the current rule, seem to be more like health insurance agent requirements in terms of um, the cost, the ongoing uh, education, and so forth, with the exception of training. And it might offer one option, which is a proficiency-based uh, approach, you know, so to make sure that people understand the requirements through proficiency rather than tying it to some um, number of hours beyond what's currently um, required. Finally, we do support the exemptions that you've made, for example, for CACs and for Medicaid. I think that's appropriate and, and appreciate your doing so. Um, thank you for your time. Good luck with your um, navigation through this issue, and, and please let us know how we can help. We look forward to it, and um, happy holidays. Thank you, Maureen. You too. I apologize for the interruption. No worries. Thank you. Okay, I believe this is Bruce Bauer. Do I have the right name? Do I have the right name? Thank yes, you. Good morning. My name is Bruce Bauer, and I'm just here as a private citizen. I'm here because this past year I had the experience of helping somebody navigate access to health care who was uninsured. And in the course of that, I had dealings with an independent agent who provided misinformation regarding access to the high-risk pool, and that misinformation delayed access to health care for that individual. I have the question as to whether these rules should not be 
run by the Medical Care Advisory Committee. The rules and the materials that the department has provided make reference to the impact of navigators regarding Medicaid. There is a federally mandated committee that advises the Medicaid program in Texas called the Medical Care Advisory Committee. And whether it would be required that these rules be vetted before that committee or not, the input of that committee in the past has provided great wisdom to uh, the process of developing state regulations. So I would certainly recommend that the Medical Care Advisory Committee consideration process be brought to bear regarding these rules. I do want to express my great gratitude to Senator Watson and um, his leadership in regard to seeing to it that the Affordable Care Act is effectively implemented in Texas. Had the person I was helping this past summer had access to affordable care through the Affordable Care Act, that person might yet be living. And I am very, very personally disappointed at the barriers that have been placed in the way of access to affordable care care in Texas. There was reference earlier this morning to the big picture. The big picture certainly includes the fact that Texas, unlike Kentucky, did not decide to operate its own insurance exchange, even though Texas, like all states, received federal funding to explore the operation of an exchange. It's not clear to me why Kentucky decided to implement its own exchange, but Texas was not able to. The big picture includes, of course, that many other states decided to expand Medicaid, whereas Texas decided to leave that money on the table for other states to use. The big picture includes the fact that in California, life expectancy is 80.8 years. In Texas, life expectancy is 78.5 years. I don't know why Californians should enjoy an additional 28 months of life on average, whereas in Texas, we do not. And so the big picture would certainly be helped in terms of life expectancy by speedy access to affordable care. There was reference earlier to the goal of protecting Texas consumers. Well. The more people who have health insurance, the fewer people there are going to be who will be uninsured and whose health care will therefore have to be borne by those who have health insurance. I would also remark that there's been reference to health care privacy. We already have in Texas a self-implementing law, Chapter 181 of the Texas Health and Human Services Code, uh, the, pardon me, uh, of the Health and Safety Code, Chapter 181 of the Texas um, Health and Safety Code, that has a very, very broad privacy law in it. It, in effect, incorporates HIPAA. It incorporates more than HIPAA. It has an enforcement mechanism. So we already have a law in place that has an enforcement mechanism that protects those who acquire protected health information. So I, I think that area is already covered. I share the comments about the need to avoid unnecessarily duplicative regulation, which um, certainly is not the usual approach uh, in Texas. I want to, in closing, express my appreciation to people uh, uh, such as uh, Mr. McKinney and his colleagues at the United Way of Texas, who, of um, Tarrant County, who have done what they can to make affordable care more accessible. And I think that rather than putting in place unnecessary regulations, unnecessary barriers, that we should instead do what we can to make use of already present protections for protected health information, make, uh, make use of the opportunity that the Affordable Care Act provides so that people do not unnecessarily die prematurely in Texas, so that maybe someday we'll actually have a life expectancy in Texas as long as in California. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next is Gabriella Sines.
Good morning. Thank you, Commissioner and Council. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. I am Gabriella Sines, the System Director for Advocacy for Christus Health. Um, as you may know, Christus Health is a healthcare system in seven U.S. states, Mexico and Chile. We have 30,000 employees, and in Texas we have 4,500 licensed beds. Last year we were the largest nonprofit provider of uncompensated care in Texas. And through the leadership of the Sisters of the Incarnate Word of Houston and San Antonio, healthcare is not just our business, but it is our mission. As you all know, hospitals across the state have been gearing up for the ACA implementation. That is in less than two weeks. Hospitals across the state have extended, expended time, money, resources, and people to get all of our staff dedicated and trained so that people that walk through our doors will be, be as helpful as possible to navigate through the system. At Christus, we are dedicated healthcare professionals. We are trained to provide fair, accurate, and impartial information. And we are trained to also refer consumers to CACs that are designated within our hospitals. I want to share with you a snapshot of some of our current activities at Christus. We do have individual CACs in each of our hospitals. We also have a 24-7 call center that is set up to help guide consumers. We have targeted marketing outreach campaigns to help with the uninsured to provide the surety and safety that they all deserve. We also are scripting with talking points all of our frontline associates, all of our doctors, and all of our staff because we want to ensure that we are helpful and we are educating the consumers that walk through our doors. We recognize that in the current proposed rules that there are activities that are exempt, like the individual CACs in each of our hospitals. However, we do have some concerns because we think that the language in the rules is very broad and ambiguous and could impose potential restrictions on our non-exempt hospital staff, doctors, and frontline associates. Also, the applicability of the rules. I know that we've mentioned that there is a lot of concern on whether or not hospitals and providers are exempt from these proposed rules. And then finally, the negative impact that this would have to, on the ongoing efforts to re reduce the number of uninsured in our state. As you have heard um, today, the rules are very broad and can be read to be very ambiguous on the activities um, that could be subject to restrictions and regulations. An individual navigator or a navigator entity that performs any navigator service, and again, navigator service is broadly, broadly defined as anything inside of S Senate Bill 1795 or included in the ACA. This could mean that anybody who explains, educates, assists even the basic com components of Medicaid chip or anything in the marketplace, that they would be subject to the restrictions imposed in the rule. Our concern is that potentially anybody who calls our center or walks through our doors, that none of our staff could actually help conceptually give them the basic information that we think they, they truly do need. We are hopeful that that is not the intended, intended result of proposed rules, and we are also hopeful that the term enrollment assist, assistance, which again would trigger the regulation of TDI, this could mean that anybody who walks in and we, we share with them that they need to navigate through the pages of healthcare.gov, does that mean that enrollment assistance, does that mean that we would be registered and have to be regulated under TDI? <clears throat> And then finally, the negative impact the rules will have on ensuring the 6 million Texan, Texans that lack coverage. That is contrary to our Christus Health mission of ensuring health care coverage for all. We do have some proposals, and we will be submitting written comments. Um, we, we do have a list of things that we think can be very helpful to help narrow the base that you are trying to regulate. We also think that there needs to be an added express exemption for all providers that are licensed under Title IV, Section B of the Health and Safety Code. We think that is a reasonable request, given that the preamble does state that this, the purpose of this rule is intended for consumer protection. We also think that there is legal argument that, ex, that with any entity that provides assistance to consumers under in, in compliance with state and federal regulations, that it could apply to the exemption could apply to health care providers. As you know, as licensed professionals, we are subject to extensive state and federal regulations and our ongoing oversight with privacy and HIPAA and all regulations because we are providers of Medicaid and Medicare. We appreciate the opportunity to testify, and we want to be as helpful as possible as you continue to navigate through this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gabriella. Um, John Davidson. Good morning, Commissioner, Counselor. 
Thanks for the opportunity to speak this morning. Um, my name is John Davidson. I'm a healthcare policy analyst with the Texas Public Policy Foundation. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm uh, here to speak in support of TGI's proposed rules for the Navigator program as published in the Texas Register, Registrar on December 6th. Um, I would say uh, in the context of uh, what's happened today um, in the announcement by the administration of an exemption of the individual mandate for those who have had canceled health insurance plans, the implementation of the Affordable Care Act has been highly unpredictable and uncertain. Um, and uh, in light of these uh, developments that change seemingly from week to week, um, and the fact that the Department of Health and Human Services does not believe it has jurisdiction over any individual or entity providing navigator services that is not a federal grant recipient, uh, it seems imperative at this point that the Texas Department of Insurance adopt regulations for individuals and organizations in Texas that are performing navigator functions, whether or not they have received a federal grant. Uh, moreover, many of HHS's standards for navigators appear only in confidential contracts with navigator organizations and are not accessible to the public because HHS has refused to provide these contracts to TDI for review and because the standards apply to grant recipient organizations, not individuals acting as navigators on behalf of organizations, state regulations on individual navigators appear to be necessary. Uh, another area TDI has rightly identified that federal regulations are insufficient is in consumer protections against misinformation and fraud. Based on statements made by Gary Cohen, the Deputy Administrator and Director of the Center for Consumer Information and Insurance Oversight to the House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform, HHS has not taken seriously the possibility that navigators could find themselves in situations where consumers mention unreported income or the navigators might encourage consumers to fail to report their income in order to receive a larger tax subsidy for health insurance on the federal exchange. In each of these scenarios, federal rules provide no guidance to navigators and do not mandate administrative action against navigators who violate state and federal law. In light of news reports, which were mentioned earlier, about navigators and navigators in training at multiple locations throughout Texas, encouraging consumers to lie about income when applying for tax subsidies, it's clear that additional state regulations to hold navigators accountable are necessary. Uh, in addition, given Secretary Sebelius' statement to Senator Cornyn last month that it is possible for convicted felons to work as navigators to obtain individual sensitive information, it is appropriate to require background checks and fingerprinting for all navigators as outlined in TDI's proposed rules. Um, and finally, I'll just say, I know that you've heard a lot of comments today, but I'll, I'll just end with, uh, with one uh, additional suggestion. Uh, navigators do lack guidance about how to comply with the Voting Rights Act, which requires that federal government applications furnish applicants a way to indicate they wish to register to vote. Uh, in light of recent news reports, which have suggested some navigator groups, such as Enroll Texas, a tax-exempt 501c3, Enroll Texas, a tax-exempt 501c3 may be attempting to cross-pollinate voter data gathered as part of their work as navigators with political action committees like Battleground Texas. Such reports are alarming in light of the Government Accountability Office open audit of Secretary Sebelius's communication on behalf of Enroll America. To ensure that registered navigators and those working for navigator organizations in Texas are not improperly engaging in electioneering activities or otherwise supporting the candidacy of an individual for government positions, all registered navigators and individuals registered as navigators, not registered as navigators, but providing navigator services, should be required to become volunteer deputy registrars subject to all applicable qualifications and restrictions set forth by the Office of the Secretary of State Elections Division. Such a requirement would ensure that if federally funded workers coordinating enrollment on the ACA exchange wish to engage in voter registration activities in Texas, they must be accountable to the state of Texas and not just Washington, D.C. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to make sure we don't have Quatave Harris or Alteria Welch here. Okay, that's the end of the cards that I have. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? No one else wants to talk? Okay. Um, let the record reflect that all those desiring to comment today have do now done so. I will issue a decision after considering the record of today's hearing 
and the January 6, 2014 hearing and any written comments received through 5, 5 p.m. January 6, 2014. If you have commented today, you do not need to repeat your comments on January 6, 2014. Thank you all for participating in today's hearing. Today's hearing for docket number 2759 is adjourned to be continued on January 6, 2014 at 9 a.m. Thank you, everybody, for going through this.